that we'll be doing, um, we've done a little bit at Convergence 2017, but especially 2018, we're going to be um, really seeking to develop leaders within the church and men and women to help lead missional communities, our great commission groups, and we're going to be doing a leadership training every other week starting January 14th. But we're asking uh, different brothers from the church to come, essentially get a chance to, uh, to get on the mic, so to speak, and to preach from God's Word. And um, I've been friends with Levi Gray for, for years. I met him through trying to write a movie about five years ago. We wanted to do a movie, and someone said, I know a guy who writes. Reached out to him. We became great friends. And he moved away to Texas. Uh, he came back, ended up finishing the script. Uh, I don't even know what's ever going to happen with it. I don't really care as much that I've got a great friend now in Levi. Uh, we got to travel to Seattle last year to go learn about missional communities. And now he's part of he's part of my missional community. And he'll be leading one hopefully here shortly. So um, we want to give a big convergence welcome. To our brother Levi Grace, he performs, uh, not performs, <laughs> as he, uh, as he uh, opens up God's word from Matthew chapter 4 and, and feeds us from the word of God. Let's, let's give it up for Levi. I'm uh, definitely really glad to be here. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Good? Awesome. Um, if you'll just turn to Matthew 4. I'll go ahead and read through it, um, just verses 1 through 17, um, and if you don't see it, you can probably read up on here if I'm not in the way, um, but I'll read through it, and then I'll pray, and then, and then we'll begin. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be God, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the title for my sermon is Christ the Victor. Um, so with this Advent series, we've been going through different uh, aspects of the life of Jesus. Um, and, it, and it's really... A little odd. Um, it's not what we normally do uh, at churches during Christmas time. Um, but we've gone through, Rick preached on the prophecies, Brian preached on birth, and I have life. And we'll also go through death and resurrection. And um, typically we just focus on the birth during during um, this time frame. But it's, it's so important to look at everything that Jesus has done and accomplished for us. Um, because if he had never come into the world as we celebrate, none of those things would have happened. So it's it's almost like getting a full picture of why it was so important that we celebrate his incarnation on the earth. Um, and today I'm, I'm here to share with you just this small aspect of the life of Jesus that I think really um, displays how important it was that he came, how important the incarnation is in our lives. 
uh, which is in Matthew chapter 4, this temptation of Jesus. And, uh, and I know many people have already shared about, about the homeless outreach we did yesterday, but, uh, but man, th- this, this right here is so related. Um, why is the temptation of Christ even important to us? Um, as we're sharing with these homeless people, before we went out, uh, we met at a coffee shop and we prayed. Um, and, and Dylan shared a verse which really hit me. Um, when Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man had no place to lay his head. Um, and the, man, that, that really hit me. And in fact, every of the like 20-something people that I, that I met, gave them a gift card, prayed with them. Um, I shared that verse as I was praying. And, and, and many, many of them, you can kind of tell it impacted them. Either they'd like, you know, kind of squirm a little bit or... Or they'd go, mm, yeah, or something like that. Just like you tell, it really impacted them uh, when they hear that. Um, and I really thought about, you know, these are people that, t- to an extent, I can't relate to these people at all. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think I've ever had a, a day in my life where I've been sleeping on the streets or sleeping outside. I've been in a warm room, unless I decided to go camping, because I do that just because it's fun. <laughs> But these people can't do it because it's fun. They do it because they have to. They do it because they have nothing else. They have nowhere else to go. Um, and we met many different people out there. Some of them, um, you know, some of them are just in between jobs. Some of them have been there for eight years, living on the streets every day. Um, so when I come to these people and, and try to offer them some kind of spiritual advice, um, it almost seems pretentious, whether that's just perceived by me or, or by them. Because I can't relate to these people. I don't have any experience of what it's like to be on the streets. So they're like, I mean, who are you telling me anything? You haven't been where I've been. But when they hear that Jesus himself was homeless, Jesus himself had no home, that when he came into this world, there was no room for him. And he was born beside animals. They they see that and they suddenly can feel like Jesus can relate to them. So that the things that he did and said and, and ultimately the sacrifice that he made on the cross for those people, um, it's, it becomes real. We can relate to those people. Now. Um, so as I prayed that, man, this this here, this is why it's so important that Jesus was tempted. Um, just because he can relate to us now. Like we, th- we're all tempted. We're all suffering from some kind of sin or We've all been in a place where we've, where we've failed and, and we've, we're just overcome by, by whatever it is we're facing. And the fact that Jesus went through these same things, especially this first verse, that he was hungry. Jesus was hungry. He needed food in order to live. And he's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights and he's hungry. We've all been hungry. So the fact that the God of the universe came into this world and needed food, needed sustenance, brings things into a whole new light. Um, so so the, the whole purpose of the sermon, just to lay it out, is that Matthew 4 really demonstrates his humanity. But not just that his humanity, not just that he could relate to us, because there's a lot of people that we can relate to. We have family, we have friends, we have so many, even people that go to church together, but those people uh, can only do so much for us. Um, but he actually is the victor. So not only can he relate to us, not only has he been in every place that, that we've been, and that's really what's demonstrated here, but also he, he was obedient. Also, he accomplished what he was called to accomplish. He overcame sin and death. So we can not only relate to him, but we can look to him for hope. But in order to really understand this passage here, I think Matthew is really pointing, um, pointing to something here which is in in Genesis with the first temptation. So in order for us to truly understand the temptation Jesus went through, uh, we should first look really to ourselves and the temptation that began with our ancestors, with Adam and Eve. Um, So that's my first point, is is the temptation of man and our disobedience uh, in order for us to really understand this passage. And uh, just in one short verse, Genesis 3, 6, it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, And that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. So there's three pieces here that highlight the temptation that Eve went through. And and I don't think it's specifically 
ways in which she was tempted, but really areas in which in which Satan came in and, and, and kind of wanted to plant those seeds. And it's those areas where we face our temptations in life. Um, the first area was when she saw that the tree was good for food. Um, and, and my first thought is that this is kind of some kind of fleshly temptation. Um, but when I think about it in context, um, it kind of sheds a new light. Because God has already told her that, that this fruit, when you eat of it, you shall die. You can eat any of the other fruit in this garden, but this fruit here, this fruit is going to kill you. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have ever been to a restaurant, if someone ever came to you and said, uh, here's your plate, if you eat it, you're going to die. I don't know if any of you wanna, would want to eat that, except maybe Norm, but uh, he eats anything. But uh, so, so ultimately, this isn't just some like fleshly craving she's having. Ultimately, when she's looking at this, this fruit, and she's saying, this fruit is going to nourish my body. Even though God has said, if you eat it, you're going to die. It's going to kill you. So she's ultimately looking at the promise of God and rejecting it so that she can have material sustenance. So I think ultimately where, where she's tempted here is in her faith. Because God has given her a promise and she does not have faith in that promise. She has faith in what she sees in front of her and not by faith in God. And the second piece is was that it was to a delight to the eyes. And that word delight really is translated desire or craving. It's used for good things and for bad things. Um, so when she's looking at this fruit, she it delights her. It's it's an object of her desire. Um, I don't, and, and this is another example of, of what we experience. A lot of times, the things we want to see, we, we pass by a shopping mall and we see people window shopping. They're just looking at something. They want that thing. And when you want something, when you desire something, you want to look at it. You want to behold it. And that's usually why we end up wanting things in the first place. And uh, John Calvin pointed out. Um, that you know, he's been walking in the garden for who knows how long, and and who was her desire in the beginning? It was God. She was walking with God, who who was glorious and holy and, and awesome. You know, He created her, and so the object of her desire is God. And then all of a sudden, she passes by this apple, and it becomes a delight to her eyes. Something that He's already said is a curse, is is disobedience. So she's taking her eyes off of Him in terms of her desire. She's taking her eyes off of God and putting it on this fruit. So I think here is where Satan's tempting her to desire something other than God. So the first part, she's taking her faith away from God and putting it into the material world. And she's taking her desire away from God and putting it towards physical things that can please her. And then the last bit is that it was desirable to make her wise. Um, and, and this one is, is huge. Because God has... God is the one who's created her and given her life, and he, he's basically ordering her life. She's living under him. And now all of a sudden, Satan's saying, oh, well, you're going to know good and evil if you eat this fruit. You're going to be like God, knowing good and evil, and you'll be wise. So what Eve is really doing here is she's realizing that maybe, maybe she's better than God. Maybe if she had what God had, she could make a better decision than him. And maybe, maybe then that fruit would be better than, than what he said. So ultimately, she's, she's taking her worship away from God. She's taking her ability to say, you're God and I'm not God. And she's saying, maybe, maybe I need to be God. Maybe I need God's place. So we have, we have these three areas of temptation where Satan is challenging Eve's faith, challenging her desire, and challenging her worship. And, uh, and I think we can all relate. We've all failed in these areas. I know, for, for instance, me, I know I've many times, taking my, my faith off, off of what God has said and onto something that, that's more material that I can see or touch or feel. I know many times I've, I've looked at something and I wanted it, I desired it, I craved it other than God. Not that, and not that we can't want things, but He's the, he's the greatest desire. He's, he should be the thing that we look at completely and love Him. And then the last bit, we, we often worship ourselves other than God. When we look at things that are true, good, and beautiful, we, we think of ourselves as the, as the judge of those things, of what's true, what's good, and what's beautiful, rather than His Word, rather than Him. So that was our failure. That's where we failed. Um, those three areas. And what was the curse for our disobedience? In Romans 3, it says, 
What then, are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we all have charged, we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. And then it goes on. There's even more and more descriptions of how we're just dead. Because of, because of our failure and our temptation, we, we are dead in our sins. We, our throats are graves. We are, we are literally graves as humans that just hold dead bodies. And that's, that's, that's ultimately the inevitability of our sin. And so with us, as we are descendants of Adam and Eve, we didn't just inherit it in the fact that we also commit those things, but, but we share the same DNA they do. The DNA of, of failure and uh, inevitability of just, there's no hope of escape from this. But then, but now in comes Christ into the scene. Um, Christ comes to earth as a man and so what he does first is, is he doesn't just immediately solve the problem by saying, okay, we're going to wipe out all sin. But he's actually demonstrating for us. He says he's coming to fulfill all righteousness. He, he doesn't need to be baptized. He doesn't need to be confirmed in all these things. These aren't requirements for him. But he's doing it. He's demonstrating to us who he is and what he can do for us. And so this temptation is, is one example. And you notice he's tempted in, in three ways. Just like in Genesis. And I think Matthew here even if he, he wasn't actually tempted in, in just three ways, I'm sure there are many other temptations he faced. But I think Matthew is pointing, pointing his back. He wants to show the Jews who are reading this, those of you who know the Genesis account, this is what Jesus did, that he's fulfilling everything. And notice he's in the wilderness where, where Israel is known to be in a place of, of failure, where we, they grumbled and complained, and, and God said ultimately, you shall not enter my rest. So he's in the wilderness so that he can be tempted. And, and the Spirit led him there for the very purpose of being tempted. And so, so ultimately Jesus is the second Adam. He's coming to, to face all of the trials and temptations that we face. And then overcome those for us. Um, so just to look at some of these temptations. So the first temptation, the tempter came and said, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And the answer he gave is very interesting. He said, but it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, the interesting thing here is that Jesus is, is giving a scripture back to Deuteronomy. When God was, was basically giving manna to, to the people of Israel, they're in the wilderness and he's giving them manna. And they're surviving off of that manna. They have nothing else to eat. This is a desolate place. And so if God were to stop speaking and stop speaking that manna into existence to rain down on them, they, they die. And so that verse he's quoting, he, he's God is saying, I'm doing this to remind you that every word that proceeds from my mouth is what, what sustains you. So if, if we saw God's word as something that we require to live, which it is. Everything that we eat comes from God. So if we saw that, we would, we would be so much more reliant on this rather than on the things that we see. So I think this is really, this is really kind of a faith issue for God, for Jesus. He's looking at this and he's saying, I'm going to trust, I'm trusting God. I'm going to trust in his word. And, it, and in essence, we're looking at his hunger here. So he's desiring, he's already desiring food because that's, that's what it means to be hungry. He's desiring food and the tempter comes and says, well, why don't you just make bread and eat it? And he, and he says, just like in the Psalms, I delight in your word, Lord. I delight in your word more than physical food. And so he decides to be obedient and deny the desire of physical things. In the second area, he takes him to the pinnacle of the temple and says, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written, He will command His angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And he says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. This is another quote back to Israel. When the people, I think it was Masa was their names, they were, they're in the desert and they're saying, God, are you really here? Or are you not here? 
in the wilderness. Are you present with us or are you not present with us? And, there, and he said, do not test the Lord. Do not doubt him. Because God promised, I'm here. And he, and he told the Israelites, he was there with the, the pillar of fire by, by night and the pillar of fire by day. He was, he was present with them and his promise was that I am present with you. But they wanted to question God. They wanted to doubt his promises. And they didn't have faith in him. But Jesus here is saying, I don't need to test God. I don't need to throw myself down to prove that God exists. And Satan's trying to tempt him to take his faith away from God and towards testing him and seeing if he's really there or not. So when we, when we test God, we're, we're doubting him. We're saying, you know, are you, really, are you really who you say you are, God? But when, if we're acting by faith, we're saying, yes, God, you're here. You've said this. You're, you're acting on your promises, no matter what we see with our eyes. And then lastly, Satan tempts him and says, all these kingdoms I'll give you if you will fall down and worship me. And he says, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve this, is, this is, can be a little confusing because Jesus is God. So shouldn't he say, well, work, I'm, I work, you worship me? But the, the point here is that is, is he's become a man. He's fulfilling his humanity. So as, as a human, he has humbled himself. It says that he did not count equality with God something to be grasped. He emptied himself of the benefits of being God so that he could, so that he could serve, so that he could serve God, even to the point of death. And many times it says that he learned obedience through suffering. So he obeyed God as the Son. He chose to do that, even in, even in coming to earth as a human. I mean, that in and of itself is one of the greatest miracles. That, that God, who is the greatest being in the world, who deserves the greatest worship, becomes man, who is probably one of the least greatest beings. Just that act in and of itself deserves so much humiliation. We think about animals that we, like ants or something, we, we, we have no consideration for just stepping on it and crushing it if it's in our way, or a spider or something. You know, there, we have no consideration for those. And so, just think about God himself becoming a man. Like, what is man to God? And yet he became that. He, he despised the shame, it says. So, so God, Jesus was perfectly obedient in the, in the wilderness as he's being tempted by Satan. And what he's showing here is that in every way that we were tempted, through his faith, through his desire, through his worship, that he was going to be obedient to the Father no matter what came. And though we failed, he stepped in our place. In every area that, that we failed, he, he crossed the finish line. He, he moved forward for us. He's, he's the perfect mediator. Because again, not only did he face the same challenges we did, so we can relate to him, but he beat them. He beat sin and death. And before he could, he could rise from the earthly grave, from the grave of death, he had to rise from the grave of humanity. Because again, we're dead. In order to be brought to life, we have to have a perfect human, someone who's actually been a human and, and faced those trials and obeyed God. And Jesus was that human. So the reward for his obedience was that he redeemed us to himself. It says in Hebrews chapter 2, for it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And then later on in the chapter it says, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. That, that right there is, is, is the crux of the whole thing. Just like these, the homeless people that are sitting out there, I have nothing to relate to these people. But I serve a God who's, who's been there, who's tempted in every way that they could be tempted. Yeah. And, and the thing is, not just homeless people on the side of the street. Every person in here, every person out in the world, every person we come to, we may relate to them on zero scale. 
except for the fact that we're human. But Jesus can relate to them on every scale. Every place that they fail, Jesus has, has risen to that challenge and beaten it. Mm. So if someone says, I'm going through this struggle or that struggle or this struggle, we can say with confidence, Jesus did that. Jesus went through that too. And he won. Yeah. So, so when you fail, it's not that just that you can succeed, but really that he succeeded so you don't have to. Mm. Because we were inevitably failures from the beginning. Our sin and our shame and our death had just put us into the grave. But through him we have resurrection power. So this is humanity restored. And I love those, those last few chapters, which, which normally aren't even included with the temptation. But he says that he went into Zebulun and Naphtali, as the prophecy said, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. For those dwelling in the region of shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Because, because God, Jesus, fulfilled the requirements of man, he has now been empowered by the Holy Spirit to go and minister and share this gospel. And what is that gospel? That, he said, began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we're in darkness and death and hopelessness and shame. But he's the light. And the light has come into the darkness. And, it, and it's not just wiping the darkness out. It's redeeming the darkness. Everything that was in the dark is now coming into the light. All of our sin and all of our shame and all of our wickedness. He's not, he's not wiping us out when he comes. But he's become like us so that he can redeem us and turn us into his children rather than the children of death and the children of Satan. This is, this is the miracle. This is the beauty. That he is a merciful and faithful high priest. So the high priest has to be a man so that he can at least make propitiation on our behalf. But he has to be a God so that he can make the payment for us that we could not make. So this is the merciful and high, faithful high priest that is coming to the Father for us with his life. Not just his sacrifice on the cross, but by his active obedience. That every step he made in life, he made as a human being, obeying God, suffering, and still obeying. So the answer is, when we come across temptation, when we come across failure, when we come across our sin, our first reaction is, is shame. And in a sense... It's, it's, it's right because, because inside of us we know what, what good and evil is and we know that we can't, we can't meet that standard. So we should be ashamed. But the beauty of it is that that's not the end of the story. And that could have been the end of the story. God could have just decided to wipe out all of humanity and solve the problem. It could have been a math problem. Wipe out the sin and then solve, problem solved. God can move on being God. And he's, just as, and he's just doing that. But thankfully, he's merciful. Thankfully, he came to this earth as a man. Because we could not save ourselves. He came to this earth to fulfill all of our requirements for us. It's all on his behalf that it comes. All his grace. Nothing from us. So that he could then save us unto himself. Hmm. So whether, whether you here are, are a Christian, whether you've been saved and still struggle with sins and temptations in your life, or whether you're not a Christian, whether you're lost and you don't know Jesus, and you're probably still struggling with the same sins, we're all equally sinful as humans. It's just a part of this world, the pain and the suffering and the death whether, whether you're homeless on the side of the streets or whether you live in a million dollar mansion, you still suffer from the same malady. And I was talking to an atheist friend of mine. Um, we've had some really good conversations over the past couple of weeks and he was, he was worried about what people might think about him for things that he's done in his past. He used to be addicted to drugs and alcohol and, and he's gotten off of it and he's like, I don't like to bring up that part of me because I don't want people to judge me. And so my answer to him was that there's two kinds of people in the world. There's the sinful people who hide it, and then there's sinful people who don't. Everyone in the world that you look at, could, the person you look at could be the most righteous person in the world, and they're still filled with sin. The only difference for those who have hope and those who don't have hope is Jesus. Because he's the only one that we can look to 
that never sinned, that was perfectly righteous on our behalf. So I'll close with this verse, which is following Hebrews 11. It talks about the hall of, of faith, is what they say. It's all these men who faith. And all the things they did were not important in that passage. It was the, the person that they did it for, the person they were looking to in faith. And this, this, this passage in Hebrews 12 really points to that fact, that there's only one thing that they all shared in common. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So again, whether, whether you're lost in your sin or whether you're a child of God, we can look to Jesus who founds our salvation and perfects our salvation in Him. Because he endured the cross. He despised the shame. And he won the victory over sin and death. And he is now in the throne, ruling. He is king. So let us have all the more inspiration from him alone to lay aside the sin that burdens us in everyday life. The temptations that come across us. It's all, it's all his grace. And we can only defeat it if we look to the one who obeyed, the one who suffered on the cross for us. What a, what a miracle of salvation we can have. What a powerful and merciful high priest we have. So let's pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you so much for, for every person in here. And I, I'm standing on this, this elevated platform with a pulpit in front of me, but I, I'm no different from any other person in here. Your apostle said that there's no temptation that is not common to man, but let he who stands beware lest he fall. God, we're all equal here. We're just humans who are broken and sinful. And our only hope is by your grace in our lives to grow and perfect us in you. So I pray that, that these humble words that I speak, Lord, that, that your spirit would empower those words to enter into the ears of whoever's hearing, Lord, and, and transform their hearts, Lord. Because it's not me that can do it, it's only you. Only your grace, only your love, only your power can transform hearts for the gospel. Lord. So I ask that everyone here listening, Lord, that you would empower them to turn to you, to repent and trust in your, your salvation, what you did on the cross for them. Trust in your grace. And then go forth into the world and share that good news with everyone around them. The hope that lies in the midst of this groaning and painful and sinful world that is just lost in failure and temptation. Lord, we thank you that, that you overcame. That you came into this world and suffered anything we could have suffered and yet we're obedient. That you run the race. And I ask that you would just fill us with your spirit. And help us every day to look to you for grace. In Jesus' name, amen.